uh, I guess maybe the better question is then, how did Russia really get here? Because 2023 appeared to be the year that uh, uh, was kind of a huge breakthrough mm -hmm. for Russia. 2022, of course, there was, um, I think, a kind of feeling out this conflict, how to fight it. And in 2023, it seemed like mm -hmm. Russia... Uh, cemented a lot of the things we already knew in 2022, but accelerated them. Uh, the, the failure of the sanctions or the defeat of the sanctions, should we mm. say, the defeat of the counteroffensive. How, how did Russia get here? Well, I think they've been working on this for a very, very long time. But I think it's also important to remember that the Russians have never wanted a confrontation with the West. Certainly Putin has not. I mean, he has been making a lot of statements recently. And by the way, one should read the Chinese press to understand what Xi Jinping is saying. One should read what he says. We don't do this actually enough. And we don't analyze these articles properly because we're always trying to second guess and find double meanings into the, what these leaders say. Whereas, in fact, it, when, it, when we read their speeches, Xi Jinping's speeches, Vladimir Putin's speech is straightforwardly. It's usually clear enough. But Putin has said this. He, he, you know, he made he and the Russian government went beyond the extra mile over the last 20 years since he was leader, became 25 years that he was leader, to try to find some kind of accommodation with the West. They um, were warning increasingly that you know the West was on a bad track that things weren't going well but they were always in the end looking for compromises they were looking for compromises over ukraine they were looking for compromises over various other things but gradually as they began to see that that wasn't going to happen and as the russian economy began to recover after the 1990s crisis in the early 2000s they began to make take precautions and to plan ahead. And um, there was a very interesting article, uh, uh, not an article, a um, meeting between um, Putin and the head of um, Rostec. Rostec, I should explain, is this gigantic Russian state-owned corporation, um, brings together all the lots of big industrial plants, factories, laboratories, scientific institutions, and whatever. It's sometimes compared with Samsung in uh, South Korea. It gives you some idea of the analog, the size of it. But he said, you know, the, you know, we're able to increase production in the way that we are in terms of weapons and other things, because we have spent the last 50 years modernizing our factories. <laughs> and that is exactly what they did. They modernized their factories. They built up their alternatives to SWIFT. They developed their connections with China and other countries in the in um, Asia. They built up their relations with India. They built up their relations with Saudi Arabia. They started from about the year 2013, a major reorganization and rearmament drive for their military. And gradually over time, they built it up. Now, the essential thing to understand is that when the conflict began, in 2022, that rearmament drive was nowhere near completed. It was still very much a work in progress. I mean, you're looking at you know numbers of tanks, numbers of infantry fighting vehicles, numbers of aircraft, numbers of troops under full time con contract. They were still relatively small. What has happened is that this war has unleashed funding within Russia to accelerate this process and to magnify this process at a far faster rate than the Kremlin had planned before. And the Russians discovered, to their own surprise, that their economy could do it. They, they discovered that, in fact, their industrial plants, their uh, laboratories, the numbers of their engineers. There were many more of them, better located, that even they themselves had realized. And, you know, this isn't, this is, 
not a mystery, it's an admission, and that, they're, uh, uh, that they've been admitting to themselves, and that their ability to absorb the sanctions shock turned out to be much greater than they had um, even themselves realized. So this is why we have come there. And this is not new, by the way. It, it has happened repeatedly in terms of Russian history, that they've prepared for a war over a long period. Then the war comes. It happened in 1812 with Napoleon, happened in 1941 with the Second World War. They prepared for it. And then they themselves are surprised that their level of preparation has been as great as it has been. And this is this is where we are. Now, I have to come back to what Alex was saying about this Lithuanian uh, foreign minister, you know, that the war hasn't turned out exactly as we expected. I, it, it irresistibly, I have to say this, reminded me of the Japanese emperor telling the people of Japan in August 1945, as he announces Japan's unconditional capitulation, that the war has turned out not entirely to Japan's advantage. I think it's it's the same kind of bizarre language. Yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, you know, uh, when you go to Russia and and you meet uh, you know you, you meet people and you talk to them there, you you understand that that that. <clears throat> They have the ability to do these things, like what Alexander was saying, but they, they do very much underestimate their ability to do these things. And and all it takes is is just just to go there, and and you understand that this is not, uh, you know, it's it's not like a a country or culture that's that's boasting about well we could produce you know ten million this and five million that. They're, it's very very low low key when it comes to. To stuff, to stuff like that, and then when they realize that they can produce these these weapons at this scale, you know, every, everyone's surprised. But but they have the ability, they have the capacity to do it, absolutely. And um, you know, the, the the analysts in the West, they they should have realized this. I mean, you figure these think tanks are getting so much money. You have so many analysts there. You you would think that that some of these people would have traveled to Russia. They would have, they would have seen. The, the the tremendous potential and ability that that Russia has the the human capital that that they have and you know you would come out with, with the conclusion that you know this country can can really you know crank up their their weapons production I mean we were doing shows even before the the conflict where where Alexander explained it he was like the Russian economy is like a big wheel and it, it's big and it's heavy it takes a little bit to start. But once it gets momentum, you know, it's, it's, there's no stopping it. And, and, and that's very much what, what we're seeing now play out in, in real time. And um, it, it just amazes me that, that all, of the, all, all of the money and supposedly all the expertise and all the analysis that's in D.C. and, and in London, and, and still to this day, they can't figure out this country. And, and you could just take a take a trip, spend a couple of years there, and and you'll you'll start to get an understanding of it. But you know, I really think that 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 a lot of it is just their own bias. They have such a visceral hatred, and and it emotionally pains them to just admit that they're good at doing what they do. That they just can't bring themselves to to get there, and, and that's what I think is it, it blocks them. Continuously, when they when they try to figure out what uh, what Russia's capable of or or what they're up to, it's it's this bias, this hatred. Mm. Where the Russians are the opposite. You know, the, the the Russians are they're reading what the what the collective West media is saying. They're reading the articles. They're studying the posts. They're trying to understand how they're thinking. They're trying to understand their next move. You know, you go to, to to someone in in DC, one of these think tankers, and you tell them Putin's very smart. Oh my God, he, he's not smart. He's the worst. Don't don't tell me he's smart. I don't want to hear it. It's it's like you've hurt them, like you emotionally damaged them. That's that's how propagandized. That's that, that's how emotional. That's that's how damaged they become by 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 everything they've they've been conditioned to to understand about about this country, its people, and its leaders.
So I think that 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 plays a huge role. Well, perhaps uh, we can now talk about what to expect in 2024. Uh, uh, I know in your programs, you have talked about the possibility of this missile campaign representing some kind of offensive. Uh, well, I, I know, Alexander, you've talked about how this fits well within Russia's key objective uh, and policy around Ukraine, which is attrition. And so with with that, then, you know, this idea of offensive versus attrition, uh, what can we expect from this conflict in 2024? You have we we were just talking, we were just looking at how the Western mainstream media is viewing this. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're talking about 2025, right? Going on the offensive in 2025. That's more than uh, a year from now, ostensibly. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot is, I predict, or I assume will happen. Um, so uh, I don't know, Alexander, maybe you can begin with what can we expect? Well, I, I think for the moment, at least, we're going to see continued attrition. That, I mean, I think that is the approach that the Russians have been following now for uh, you know the whole of the war and it's worked well for them they've seen western arsenals deplete they've seen uh, ukraine's military degrade they're gradually now moving over to, from what they call active defense to the situation where they're able to increase their areas of control they're not yet started anything remotely like a general offensive and i think this is a point which needs to be made clear but they you know they will continue to pummel away at the ukrainians keep the ukrainians um busy prevent the Re ukrainians resting refitting rebuilding their army to the extent that they can they will continue hitting ukrainian uh, industrial facilities they will continue chasing and destroying to the extent that they can and degrading the ukrainian air defense system and it's very difficult for us as outsiders to know exactly how ex the russians intend to plan this thing the one thing that i think we can say about the russian military is that the people who run it are professionals. I mean, they're people who are who've studied war, who work through the various academies of the general staff, who are highly educated in war planning. And at the same time, they, the military people and the political leadership, are relatively risk averse. They're not going to take big gambles and extraordinary risks, which might upset the calculus of the war so they're going to continue grinding they're going to continue advancing steadily and methodically until i suspect the point comes when they sense that ukrainian ability to continue to um, provide the kind of resistance which ukraine is still able to provide now becomes exhausted and then i think we will see a much bigger offensive and we will start to see the big armor divisions, the mechanized divisions, the ones with the tanks and the infantry fighting vehicles, which I haven't really seen for a long time in this war. They appeared briefly at the start, then they were pulled back in April 2022 when it looked like there was going to be a peace. But the, at that point, they will probably come back and there'll be much bigger numbers, many more of them that time. And at some point, I still believe that that kind of offensive will come because wars have to end if there's not going to be a diplomatic solution. There has to be a military one. And I personally cannot see how you can achieve a victory without going on the offensive at some point. And I think that this is probably the calculation in Moscow. Now, what the time frame is, I don't know. Uh, one Russian official, who's Vladimir Saldo, who is a civilian officer, official in Kherson region, he's come said he thinks the war will end in about six months' time, that this is when, you know, this big Russian offensive will come. Another Russian official, a military officer, also gave about the same sort of time frame. Others think it'll be later than that, maybe August, September, conveniently close notice to the American election. There's even reports that were circulating some weeks and months ago that um, it might be in 2025. 
And of course, if you believe Nikkei in Japan, the Russians are planning for a five year war. <laughs> that was supposedly what Putin said to Xi Jinping in March. I don't believe the last, by the way. I don't know what the evidence for that is. So I, I, I think that at some point there will be a big offensive. Will it be this year? I think personally that is very likely, but I am not going to second guess Russian plans. Yeah, and I think we have to wait and see a uh, short term, like in the next, well, definitely <clears throat> the next week, we have to see what Congress is going to do yeah. with uh, with the $61 billion to to Ukraine. We'll see what will happen there. And then in uh, February, based on what Congress does, we'll see what uh, what they do with the Russia frozen assets mm-hmm. and the $300 billion. Mm-hmm. So I think we have to look at those two, mm-hmm. two uh, events and see what happens. And you know, you could be looking at a significant amount of money uh, going to Ukraine, mm. which would obviously prolong the the conflict. Right so we have to see what's going to happen there. You know, to close on Ukraine, maybe briefly uh, summarize, if you could, the logic of attrition for Russia at this very moment in 2024. Given all that we talked about, a lot of people come up to me and say, "Danny, why does Russia just?" end this thing now with all of the military advantages the economic stability uh why is it that russia continues to fight attrition when uh all indications are that uh ukraine is on the ropes and that the united states and and it's uh nato uh uh uh, vassals so to speak Mm. its partners are also on the ropes You see, this is where I think, and it's something which Alex and I um, were talking about right from the start of the war. I mean, you know, neither of us is a military person, not by any stretch of the imagination. But most of us are familiar with political, philosophical thinking in Russia. The thing to understand about the Russians is that for them, war which is something that they are very familiar with. Russians understand war. I mean, it's very much ingrained and part of their history. War for them is a political thing. It's not about, you know, big offensives, seizing cities. It's about destroying the enemy so that the enemy is not able to continue resistance and to come back. And the point about attrition is that it achieves two things. Firstly, it weakens Ukraine to the point that when Ukraine is defeated, it cannot resume the war at any future point. If you just send large tank armies deep into Ukraine, you're going to suffer huge casualties yourself. You will win, but a quick victory is scarcely ever a fully decisive one. So the Russians want to attrition attrition Ukraine, as they put it, to demilitarize Ukraine, to grind it down to the point where it no longer can ever be, again, a threat to them. And of course, the other political dimension, which the Russians are always far more conscious of than people in the West understand, is that they always look at the political and diplomatic factors, sentiment within Russia itself. They don't want huge casualties because that might not be entirely uh, you know, successful. It might not go down well with the Russian population. It might put major strains on Russian society and on the Russian economy. And uh, again, this is something the Russian government does think about. But also Russia's diplomatic and political alliances, its capacity to keep not just China, which is, I think the Russians have gradually come to feel is a steady friend, but other countries like India, the global South, the Middle East states, to keep them on side, to say to them, look, we are measured moderate people. We are going to proceed in a measured moderate way. We're not going to rush to victory. We're always open to negotiations and to discussions with the other side. But of course, until we get those serious offers of negotiation, we have no choice but to keep fighting. And so playing it slow and playing it long works to the Russians' advantage in multiple terms. It means their military 
is getting stronger rather than expending its military power on you know with huge losses it means ukraine is getting weaker it means the west is also getting weaker it means that diplomatically russia is getting stronger and politically the government itself in russia is getting stronger now if you are classically trained as i once was by the way and you know your greek and roman history you will know that the the romans had an expression for this festina lente make haste slowly and that exactly sums up the russian approach yeah look at what russia has accomplished mm. to be honest in in two years and and ukraine is just one part of of this big war and mm. Lavrov always would call it a hybrid war. Hmm. He would always, when he would always mention the conflict in Ukraine, he would say this is a hybrid war with the West because it had many facets. And and you know, just this year, you had BRICS with Saudi Arabia, Iran, UAE, Ethiopia, Egypt. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a big deal, and this was not going to happen if if Russia didn't play the the game, the way they played it in the beginning of the conflict, by taking it slow, understanding what they needed to do step by step, and not just going in there and breaking everything. And, and so I think they had other goals in mind. And, and I'm positive that they were liaising with the Chinese, with the Indians, Brazil, South Africa, and they were, they were talking about these things. And I think they saw Ukraine as just a important, significant part to to something that's much bigger, and and I think the conflict in Ukraine, the way the West reacted, the way the West reacted, just accelerated the momentum behind BRICS. I mean, the West really did it to themselves in their reaction because they got emotional about everything, and you know the the BRICS they just played it cool, and now here you are with uh, 2024, and and you have. Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Russia in the same organization with China there, the manufacturing, the energy, the commodities, the population. Yeah, no, I mean, when, when I'm asked this, I, I go, well, why would Russia do anything differently given exactly as you both stated? Uh, you both remember the beginning of this conflict in 2022, the United States and NATO, they tried their hardest to basically shift public opinion completely against Russia. They tried to move the entire world against Russia. And now in just under two years, uh, Russia has flipped that completely on its head where where Russia indeed has gained the trust, uh, not just of Russian people. Uh, not just the region, but really the world has seen uh, it, just how this conflict has actually gone and what the risks are for the world, not because of Russia, not because of anything Russia was doing or has done, but because of how this conflict was provoked and then how it was fought on, on the U.S. and NATO side. And, and all of these countries that you mentioned, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and many more have made calculations that they need to have what the Western mainstream media sometimes says is an insurance policy. They need to have uh, options. They need to have alternatives. And, and that is a huge victory for Russia. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next video.